Chapter 1 Christmas 2018 Hello, my name is Bobby. The stories that you are about to hear happen to people associated with me in my hometown, Bismarck, the capital of North Dakota. Maybe you have no idea where Bismarck is, but let me start by telling you that it is the northern state in the central part of the country, bordered by Canada. We mainly are farmers, and agriculture is our main activity, but we also produce oil. We are the fourth most sparsely populated state in the country. One lesser known fact about North Dakota is that the KVLY-TV mast is the tallest broadcasting mast in the world, being 2,063 feet tall, transmitting the local Channel 11 signal from Blanchard. I am a retired school teacher, 75 years old. And, as a widower, I spend most of my time reading and watching my favorite shows on TV. I love sports and keeping track of them on my calendar hanging on the wall in my kitchen, because I don't want to miss one single event each month. It was a year ago when this all started to happen. It was very overwhelming, way too much for me. I learned that there was a reason for every one of us to be involved in this to be a part of it. Let me start with Tony. She was in her late 30s. She's my next door neighbor. As you can imagine, winters here in the north part of the country are pretty rough. We all know how to deal with ice, rain, and snow, but that morning, the week after Thanksgiving, it was horrible for Tony and her family. Her husband was involved in a car accident on Highway 94. I was picking up my newspaper from the driveway when I heard her screaming. I turned around to try to understand what was happening, and I decided to go to her home. I walked on the cement onto her driveway. When I looked up at Tony, I saw that she was completely inconsolable. Her two little ones were crying when they saw her out of control. I knocked on her door and she finally opened the door. Crying, she jumped into my arms screaming, He's gone! Bobby, my husband died in a car accident just now! The only thing that I could do was hold her for a while. I was in shock as well, but eventually the kids needed attention. So I took control of the situation in the house and asked her if we could call someone to help with the kids. She gave me her friend Belinda's phone number. I called her and she came to the house in a matter of minutes. I barely had time to get my coat and gloves on and lock the door of my home. I drove my car and took Tony to take care of everything. Tony was a strong woman, but those days she was lost and out of it. Nobody could do much for her other than watch the kids, which her friends did. I drove her everywhere she needed to go, until the day of the funeral. After that, Tony started to retake control of her life slowly. Her family lived in another state, so they couldn't stay longer. Because Tony worked for the city, they gave her a month to take care of her personal things. Tony was on my radar every day. My life changed drastically because of her unfortunate situation, and I felt I needed to be there. Two weeks later, I received a phone call from my buddy Ethan. He's my poker night partner, an unusual case of a millennial having custody of his seven-year-old son, Hugo. Ethan was putting Christmas lights on the roof of his house, and little Hugo followed Ethan and fell. I was with Ethan as I was helping watch Hugo full-time at the hospital. A few days later, we received the report from the doctor that Hugo would never walk again. His spine was broken in many places. He would be in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. You can imagine how Ethan felt. My heart was broken for Hugo and Ethan. Although we all understood it was an accident, Hugo moved too quickly on the roof in a fraction of a second while Ethan was securing the lights and coming to the back of the window. But there was nothing that anyone could do. A week later, Ethan was back home with Hugo in a wheelchair. Both were severely affected, mentally and emotionally. I went every afternoon to help Ethan with certain things. My mornings were busy with Tony and her kids. When I came back home around 5 p.m., I was exhausted and very sad for the situation of both families. One afternoon, as I was parking in front of my home, I saw the silhouette of a man waiting for me, sitting on the bench on my front porch. It was Billy. Billy is my 55-year-old nephew, the son of my sister, who is a sweet family man and a devoted music teacher for the school district. I knew that something was wrong. I just thought, man, now what? I got out of my car and told him, son, let's get inside. It's too cold outside. 
We walked inside of the house, and I asked him, What's going on, Billy? He was speechless, just shaking his head. I waited. After nearly five minutes of silence, just waiting like that can drive you nuts. You see someone who's unable to speak, they don't know where to start, and you're waiting to hear a horrendous story. Death, murder, or something awful. And he finally said, I lost my job. After 23 years of working for them, they fired me today because they consider me way too old-fashioned to teach. I'm only a few years from my retirement, and now I don't know what I'm going to do to take care of my family, to pay my mortgage, and all the bills. Uncle Bobby, this is absolutely unfair. Then he quietly started to cry. I just closed my eyes for a moment and thought, Dear God, thank you that it is not that bad. However, Lord, why are all of these things happening to people around me? I went to hug my nephew, and he sobbed like a little boy in my arms. He was devastated. He couldn't believe that after so many faithful years of work that they fired him. I fixed tea for both of us and told him that everything would be alright, and that tomorrow we would sit down again and talk more about it. But as for tonight, he needed to come back home, tell his wife about it, and in a calm way tell her that he will come back to speak with me about a plan, and he did just that. I barely had time to grab my notebook and the materials of the lesson we were studying with my small group in the house of one of my friends, but I drove fast enough in order to arrive on time. I got there a few minutes later, but it was not a big deal. I quickly got situated in my chair in the living room of Scott's house when I noticed the presence of a young girl to the group. After our meeting, I was introduced to Melanie, a 19-year-old girl. She had just moved from Idaho to North Dakota. She had problems with her mother, and her aunt was kind enough to receive her in her house here in Bismarck, with the condition of going to the small study group and to church. Melanie was unhappy about that. After the lesson was over, Melanie offered me a cup of tea, which I accepted. She immediately gravitated around me and told me part of her story. She said, I don't understand many things in life, and now I'm stuck now with my religious aunt and this bunch of old people. She then realized what she'd said, and she added, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. I replied, well, you're right. We are a bunch of old people to you, but not everyone here in this group is as old as I am. Actually, there's some people here in their 30s, and others in their 40s, but I understand that you're frustrated. I smiled at her. Then Melanie said to me, do you know that you have a beautiful smile? Then she jumped into my arms and held me for a little while. Everyone else in the group was giggling and smiling at me. I was just moving my eyebrows like saying, I don't know why she's doing this. Chapter 2 Spring 2019 the festivities on Christmas and New Year's were difficult for everyone who just lived recent horrendous experiences. Tony became a young widow with two little ones. Ethan had to now take care of a five-year-old child in a wheelchair. Billy lost his job during the most difficult time of the year. Lastly, Melanie had been reluctantly relocated to a totally new city and state and had to live in a new family member's house. During those nights, when I could finally come back home, after helping each of them with little things, I found myself rushing to take care of my own things in the house and writing notes about my responsibilities for the next day. Responsibilities that nobody assigned to me, but me. No one said to me, Listen, Bobby, now you need to take care of all these people and do something about it. No, that was not the case. One night, I was sitting on my bed, and while reading my checklist for the next day, I put the list aside and started to reflect about something that was happening to me. The pain in my right elbow, my scratchy glasses, the loud heater in the kitchen, and the poor internet signal in my room were not bothering me anymore. I shook my head and realized that by being occupied and helping others, those problems that I used to see as big problems became almost insignificant issues. I thought that night, maybe God allowed all of these things to happen around me to teach me something. Every day when I was with Tony, I was nice to her. I showed her respect and was affectionate with her so that she felt loved and special. I smiled at her and helped her with the little chores in the house, 
running errands and picking up the kids here and there. Slowly, Tony began to learn the new life she needed to live. Throughout the winter, she was able to slowly come back to work. The daily activities were keeping her on track with things. Some nights, I had food to share with her and ate dinner with her and the kids. Sometimes, she and the kids would eat in her home, and other times, they would eat in my home. Eventually, she felt up for doing something in her garden, and in the spring, we planted beautiful flowers, as I have in my own garden. She was so proud of her effort. She used to talk to me about her husband while we were in the garden, and the kids were playing around us. She found a lot of healing by doing that, and I felt honored to be a part of her life during that time. On the other hand, Ethan got a new position with his company that allowed him to work from home full time. He was smart and qualified to earn that position, and his supervisors knew that little Hugo needed Ethan close by more and more. I went to see Ethan three or four times per week by appointment only, because now with him working from home, that changes things with visitors. Initially, I didn't think much of it. I just drove to his home, rang the bell with a box of donuts thinking he was home, and we would talk and play with Hugo. The beauty is that now Ethan could do a much better job overseeing his son. Hugo was enrolled in a special kids school, and the schedule was awesome when it came to Ethan's work. Hugo gave Ethan and I a big surprise one day in the park. Hugo showed us that he could go really fast in his wheelchair, and said, Dad, I think I'm going to be in the Special Olympics one day. We were amazed. In January, my nephew Billy figured out a way to receive unemployment help for a little while. That helped him to overcome his immediate needs while continuing to search for a long-term answer. One day, Billy came to my home and started to play my old piano. I loved to hear the piano being played. I never played it. It was my wife's. So, Billy really indulged me by playing. Suddenly, we heard someone at the door. It was my other neighbor. I invited him to come in and introduced him to Billy. We drank some coffee, and my neighbor approached Billy directly by saying, Do you teach the piano to children? Billy laughed and said, Yes. Well, not really. I mean, well, it's a long story. I told the story to my neighbor, and he said, Listen, Billy, I have two children with the gift of music, and I desperately need a private tutor. Would you teach them piano, please? Billy, with a big smile, replied, Oh yeah, absolutely. During the spring, Billy already had several students. He became the only private tutor in the area. His employment fund could stop now. Billy found the path for his future, and he loved it. And what about Melanie, you're wondering? Well, Melanie decided to rebel out at school, and she got into fights with some girls. She made no friends in her neighborhood, and the only person that she talked to was me. Belinda begged me to spend time with Melanie and help her. Since I once was a school teacher, I offered her my help in catching her up with school. This worked out perfectly, because now she was forced to be accountable to me when it came to homework, and now Belinda would know her whereabouts. Step by step, Melanie began to learn the fundamentals of her classes. That is when I found out that her behavior problem was based on her inadequacy as a student. Therefore, she was feisty and came across like she was negative and rude. The more that Melanie learned to be a better student, the better she became, and then she was more jovial and relaxed. She even changed her attire and started to look prettier. Chapter 3 Summer My life has changed a lot since last Christmas. From a life that was mainly idle and very easy, a life that was pretty much self-centered, to a life where I was quenching fires with Tony, Ethan, Billy, and Melanie. Oof, my life really has changed. But I have no regrets. As a matter of fact, I like my new life better. If you ask me why, I would tell you that it is because it is more exciting. I know it's hard to understand, and maybe it's not easy to explain, but it is really exciting to know that I can do things and help others. Hey, don't take me wrong, my plate is full, but honestly, it makes me feel more alive, happier, like I'm someone really important to others. During the summer, I took a trip with Tony and the kids. We went camping for three days. They've never done that before, 
I had all the gear, and I knew the Crystal Springs camp very well. We all had a blast. I had wanted to go there for the last several years, but I never did after I became a widower. Maybe it was the memory of my wife, or simply I was just too lazy. I don't know. My camping trip with Tony and the kids was fantastic. They learned how to fish, put things together, cooking outside, and the sunsets were sensational. They had the time of their lives, but I had the time of my life too. It's incredible how all those activities with Tony and her kids brought so much healing to them and to myself as well. I never thought that I needed that, but I did, and I'm so grateful that Tony was willing to do things like that with me. I love her little ones, and they love me right back. We have tons of pictures, and they put them all up on their Facebook page. I became popular, I guess. Ethan decided to take us on trips to places for Hugo to practice sports and wheelchairs. First, we went to Dreams in Motions in North Dakota. He then took us to Eagle Mount Billings in Montana. Then, we went to Teton Adaptive Sports in Wyoming. But Hugo's favorite place was the Dream Adaptive Recreation in Montana. Little Hugo developed the attitude of a true champion. Anyone would think that after that kind of an accident to a five-year-old raised by a single dad, that the life of that child would be over. But guess what? Whoever thinks this way is wrong. This experience has showed us that if you take the pieces of your life and put them in the right hands in the right place, it's just a matter of putting the vision and effort together to see the results. Ethan did that, and I'm so proud of being a part of their lives. I felt like a hero while Hugo was competing in racing. I felt more alive by helping Ethan carry all the gear to bring Hugo to all of those places than all the rest of my days in my living room just sitting in my chair watching TV shows. After Billy realized the impact he was making in the community, he decided to open his own private music academy. He needed a financial partner, and because I had some funds in the bank, I decided to become an investor at my 75 years of age. For the first time in my life, I'm an investing businessman. Can you believe it? I can't. My children told me that I was crazy, but I did it anyway. Billy is my sister's boy. I would do it for my own children, but they don't need it. They're doing just fine. Billy needed my support, and he's doing terrific, developing his own programs, which he is calling Old School Programs, to learn music. His YouTube channel is followed by hundreds of people all over the country, who believe that learning music using the old school technique is perfect for kids. Now, my main challenge is Melanie. This summer, she worked for Billy's Music Academy, and babysat Tony and Ethan's kids. But we needed to figure out what to do for Melanie herself. She didn't show interest in any field, and the funny thing is that whenever I want to talk to her about her future, I find her constantly doing things with her hair, all the time in front of the mirror. She's still a mess, but we love her. Chapter 4, Bobby's Christmas Party In the fall one afternoon, after school started, Melanie came to receive her classes with me at my house. As I was drinking a cup of tea, I was looking at her through the window when I had an idea. I grabbed my car keys and went outside and started the car, and told her, Get in the car, girl. She laughed and asked me, Where are we going, Bobby? I said, It's a surprise. Like any teenager, she was excited about it, she was smiling from ear to ear, wondering where I was taking her. I drove her towards a shopping center near my home. I knew a hairstylist named Carmen. Everyone called her Carmencita. She was this cute, adorable lady with a precious smile that everyone loved. She owned her beauty salon, and I went there with Melanie. As we were walking toward the place, I noticed Melanie's jaw going down and down and down. I knew it. We came inside, and I asked Carmen Sita if she could talk with us for a few minutes. She agreed, and I said, My dear friend, I need a big favor from you. Carmen Sita replied, What is it, Bobby? I said, This is Melanie from Idaho. She now lives here in Bismarck. Melanie is a girl who is pretty much into fashion and beauty. I wonder if you could hire her as an apprentice here in your beauty salon. Melanie couldn't believe it. She was in shock. Carmen Sita was smiling. I suppose she knew when a girl had a passion for it, and she knew Melanie had it. So, Carmencita, what do you say? 
Carmencita replied, I think we can give her a try. Melanie jumped into my arms so excited and kissed me several times yelling, Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. This is what I wanted to do. Melanie hugged Carmencita and thanked her as well. Then I said, well, you girls need to talk about a schedule and all those things, so I'll leave you both alone and I'll come back in a few minutes. I need to make some phone calls. And then I left. I came outside of the beauty salon and saw through the window the two girls engaged, like they knew each other since forever. That really made my heart happy. I immediately called Tony, Ethan, and Billy and asked them to meet me in my home this coming weekend because I had a proposition to make to all of them. They agreed and consented to meet me on Sunday afternoon. That Sunday afternoon, I asked Melanie to come earlier to help me set up the table with snacks and refreshments. The rest of them came at exactly 4 p.m. They knew each other because of my conversations about them, and they had met in person with each other just for a moment here and there. But this was the first time I had them all together in the same time. They were curious, so I said, I know you want to know what it is the reason for this meeting, and I will tell you, but before that, I want to bring to your attention some things. I continued, you might remember that we've known each other for many years. Tony, you moved in this neighborhood five years ago. Ethan, you've played poker with me for over four years now. And Billy, you are my nephew. The newest acquisition to this group is Melanie, who came into my life nearly a year ago. They nodded, acknowledging that I was right. I continued, Well, you also remember the tragic events of last year. Tony lost her husband in that car accident, Hugo fell from the roof, Billy lost his job, and Melanie moved from Idaho. All of those events were very dramatic for all of us. Tony cried silently for a moment. Ethan's head lowered, Billy took a deep breath, and Melanie just shook her head. I said, I didn't call you all here today to make you feel bad or sad about these unfortunate incidents. Each one of you is special to me, and I love you so very much. Please look at me and tell me if you know that I love you. Each one of them did that, and all of them said, yes, Bobby, you love us so much, and we love you very much too. I said, thank you, and I know that, but there is a reason why I have mentioned these things to all of you today. This is why I have a plan. Tony said, a plan for what? I replied, a plan for this year's Christmas of 2019. Ethan said, Bobby, I love you, man, but I'm not religious at all. I don't know what you're trying to do, but I'm not a Christmas kind of guy. I said, well, it's a plan for Christmas because it has nothing to do with the season, but not necessarily for you to celebrate anything. Let me explain, okay? Billy said, yes, Bobby, you have the right to explain that. Please do, right, Ethan? Ethan replied, yes sir, I apologize, please explain. So I said, my life has drastically changed in a good way since each one of your lives has been impacted this year. I was very comfortable in doing my own things before you had your incidents, but for a reason you came to me during those days, and for a reason I was available and very willing to help each and every one of you. I helped you because you are my friends, but you also helped me. Ethan said, Helped you, Bobby? Are you kidding? You're the only one here helping us, and helping us for free, not just once, but all the time. I said, I understand, Ethan, but you need to see the other side of the coin. Each one of you have helped me to embrace a life in a different way. I gave you my love, time, dedication, and help, but you have also given me your love, time, dedication, and help. You don't see it, but it's true. Tony said, Dear Bobby, you are so kind, but in truly and total honesty, you are the magnificent person here, not us. I said, I see your point, Tony, but you still don't see it, and that is my point. I need you to see something here. Melanie said, I'm so confused. Billy added, Well, Uncle, you better explain what you're saying because I can't see it either. I said, As I said earlier, my life was already settled, which is good and comfortable for a 75-year-old man. But with you being incorporated into my life, I assumed several responsibilities to help you go through life as was needed. Agree? They replied, agreed. I continued, okay. As I began to fulfill those responsibilities, whether I was doing a little chore for you, running an errand, or helping you buy something, or whatever, those little things that I began to do for you 
started to make me feel good about myself because I was doing something for someone that was in no position to pay me back. Tony, Ethan, Billy, and Melanie were now understanding what I was saying, and slowly they began to comprehend my message. I said, so now you see my point. I had to ask you to help me to help others. Ethan said, how? I said, I want us to start to pay attention to what's going on in the community, in your neighborhood, in your family, with your friends and co-workers, and so forth. You'll notice that there are people in need. Tony said, oh yeah, there are many needs out there. I said, I know, but what I'm saying is that I want us to pay attention to those cases that are close to us. We can make a list of people that are in more need than others, and we can do something to help those in need, especially during this part of the year. Because it is Christmas season, people are more open to share their needs and to receive help from others. However, if you remember, you also began to receive my help last year during this exact same time of year. Billy said, absolutely, you're right about that. Tony said, I agree, it's time for us to help others. Ethan said, yes, now it's our time to help other people in need. Melanie said, and you, Bobby, gave us a tremendous example of that, not just by helping us during that Christmas season, but to keep in touch with us throughout the whole year. And still today, you keep your heart full of love for us and keep helping us. I said thank you, my dear friends. I knew that I could count on you for this. Thank you very much. Ethan said, you know what, Bobby? Even though I'm not religious, I'm willing to do whatever you think we should in order to help others, even if you want to call it Christmas help or whatever. I'm okay with it. I said, thank you, Ethan. The truth is that all I have done for you, I did it because God gave me the time, money, strength, love, and the desire to help you. So we all need to give our thanks to God for our friendship. Tony said, I have an idea. What if we have a 2019 Christmas party, and we bring people that we think are in need, and we share with them a meal and have some small presents, just to start out a relationship with them? What do you think? Billy said, I think that's a great idea. Ethan and Melanie said, me too. Then I said, great, well, it's a done deal then. We will have our first Christmas party here in my home to help the families and friends that we find are in need in our community. But I have a question. What are we going to call this event? All of them replied, yelling in unison, Bobby's Christmas party. And all of them laughed hard, joining their hands together as a signal of victory, as friends determined to help the less fortunate in our towns. A year ago, I had no idea of the drastic events that were about to unfold to the people around me. What I never thought about was how I would become a happier person simply by helping them. But my favorite thing about all of this is that my friends now are willing to help others. Maybe you're going through a rough season. You need to find someone, a good friend, to talk about it. Or perhaps you know someone who's going through a tough season, and maybe you can help that person. You never know what you are capable of doing until you try it. Who knows, maybe one year later, you'll be sharing with me your own stories. Merry Christmas, everyone. Bobby. Thank you for listening to my story. I am Gian. I would like to invite you to go to my website, mygiancarlo.com. Or you can go to the Facebook page, Gian Audiobooks. Also, you can check our YouTube channel, Gian Audiobooks. Thank you.